Scripture says that no matter where we go, we can never get away from his presence. He sees us. He hears us. He knows what we have need of before we ask. Never is he going to leave us. He'll never forsake us. He's got great plans for us. And Scripture tells us that he's working all things together for our good and for his purpose. Those are things that we can trust in and know. This is God's, God's uh, promise to us. And so when the storms come and when life and all the stuff out here comes, seems like it's coming against us, we can step back and take a big picture view of things and say, God, I know you're good. I know you hear me. I know you see me. And I know you're working everything that's going on, even the bad things that seem to be happening in my life for my good. There's always in every situation, in every circumstance, the perspective that God, even this, you will use for my good. How many of you believe that? All right, we're gonna get into a message here in the book of James, we're starting a series. But before we do that, I'm gonna ask if the ushers would come. There's an announcement in your bulletin about a special offering that we're receiving today. And uh, that is this, we're buying turkeys. Originally we had planned for you to bring frozen turkeys here to the church and we're gonna collect 300 frozen turkeys. And just the logistics of that kind of seemed a little overwhelming of transporting, you know, 20 pound, 15 pound, whatever. That adds up pretty quick, plus just storage and all of that. But we've partnered together with some ministries in, in, the, in the city, in the area, with hy V's help. Uh, we're going to just collect money. Uh, we're going to buy the turkeys from hy V, and they're going to help deliver them where they need to go. So it's a great win-win deal here. So we're going to do this like a dollar blessing. You can pass money down the aisle if you want to buy a turkey. We figure it's about $20 for a turkey on average. If you want take care of buying five turkeys, that's $100. If you just got a dollar or two that you wanna pass in, that's great. There's no pressure here. We're just wanting to do some good. So a dollar, you know, a dollar might buy that little wing tip of the turkey, which is still, still works. It all goes into making good gravy and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, your participation in any way, we just wanna help people who are in need uh, as it comes up to the holiday season here. So. Thank you for, for giving in that. So I struggle with the title for my message. I'm not a, a great title person like um, Pastor Hawkins always has, very thoughtful, thought-provoking, uh, creative titles. And so I, I went through a few here thinking as we start this series in James, uh, if, if you've read through James or know much about the book of James, uh, he gets right into it right away here. And so my, my task this morning is we're going to speak on this topic of, of trials. And so I thought here, a title might be Problems, Everyone's Got Them, or tr Transformed by Trials, or Be Better, Not Bitter, which all those could work. And I just kind of landed on this one, the, the good thing about bad things. How many of you ever had bad things happen to you? Like Regularly. If you've lived long enough, you know that you are just a moment away, a day away. If you're not in the middle of some kind of a trial or tribulation or some kind of trouble, uh, get ready because it, it could happen any moment, all right? Life, is, life comes that way, and so uh, it's a very appropriate topic, topic this morning. And uh, I had originally wanted to uh, maybe start with a, with a hymn. How many of you know the hymn, He Keeps Me Singing? Okay, some of you may recognize the, the, the tune, which I'm not, very, I'm not a great singer, so maybe I should just read the words to you. What do you think? You want me to sing? Yeah. Oh, why did I do that? Pastor Hawkins, you never get yourself into situations like this. <laughs> All right, here we go. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's ebb and flow. And the chorus is, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. 
fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Fourth verse says this, though sometimes he leads through waters deep, trials fall across the way. Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep, see his footprints all the way. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. We changed keys only five times in there because that's how I lead. All right, so here's the, here's the, there's some good, there's some good lyrics there as we talk about trials and troubles and all of that, and the, and the last verse of that chorus says, he keeps me singing as I go. The fact that he's put a song, a melody, uh, hope and joy in our hearts amidst the trials and the tribulations and the storms and circumstances that seem like that at times they can come against us, we can still be singing about a Savior who loves us, who cares about us, and has promised to take those circumstances and work them in such a way that it's for our good and for his purpose in the world. So, what do you say we get started? Enough singing. I didn't even, I told Pastor Brett he was gonna play or something. (laughs) I sung it anyway, so. Oh, well, thank you. Pastor Brett said that was beautiful. You still got those plugs in your ear to where you can't, yeah, gotcha. <laughs> so as we talk about trials in, uh, in, in James, we'll get to the scripture here if you want to turn to James chapter one, if I haven't told you to do that already, but there's a lot of people who have misconceptions about the fact that as Christians, they feel like as Christians, we shouldn't have any problems. That all, when you become a Christian, all your problems are solved. And if, if you're going through a trial, there must be something wrong with you. You ever felt that way before? What's wrong with me? Why me? Here's what Jesus said. He said, expect trials. It's not a matter of if. It's just a matter of when. He said in John 16, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You see, God takes adversity and he uses it to transform us why is it that he does that through trials he trials have a way of molding us or shaping or strengthening us making us more the kind of person that he intends for us to be he takes our circumstances and works them for our good there's times that we long for days where there's no trouble You know, it's like when we're in the midst of a storm, when we're in the midst of a trial, it's easy to find ourselves daydreaming. I wished I was on a beach somewhere. Or my wife, I wish I was stuck in a snowbank somewhere. She likes snow. She doesn't want to be on a beach. But you start daydreaming of of somewhere that's peaceful, apart away from any kind of trouble, where life is easy and life is smooth and there's no trouble. The truth is, If we had an easier life, we would lose our spiritual fiber. There's something about the trouble and the trials and and all of that that uh, brings strength into our life because we know that uh, any time we're gonna grow, it comes through exerting or through energy, like you take an athlete, for instance. What's, the, what's the, the saying that everybody, I mean, this is the, athletics, the ath, athlete's motto, no pain, no pain, no gain. So bring it on, the tougher, the better, the, the heavier I'm gonna, the stronger I am. And, and that's just the way it goes. And it works that way, not only in, uh, in sports, but you look at in the military world, if someone's gonna move up in rank, uh, it's because they've been in the battle and they've been tested and they've proven themselves. The only way that you're gonna be able to prove yourself or be, uh, come out is to go through that trial or go through the battle. And it's those tests and those trials that really shape us and make us and prove to us what's going on on the inside. So we gotta think of our life as a Christian as uh, the trials are the training. It's the training that we go through. What is a trial? 
I don't think we have a hard time defining that, but I want to I help you this morning. Uh, uh, we'll look at it from this perspective, that a trial is a divinely appointed or something that God allows for us, either he causes or allows, but it's a divinely appointed difficulty with the whole perspective that it's going to chip away at any imperfections in our life and make us more like Jesus. How many of you want to be like Christ? You want to be more like Jesus. The truth is, is that is his purpose and plan for each one of your lives. This is, uh, this is what uh, Paul tells us that God's purpose for our lives in Romans eight twenty nine is that we be conformed to the image of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 3, 18, he says, we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of God are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another. So when we become face to face with him and the realities of life, we become more like him and, it, and he uses those search situations in our life to make us more like him, to make us stronger, to make us better. Uh, and, and in a moment we're gonna read James where he says the whole goal is to be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And he talks about the trials and he uses this word that we find connected with trouble and trials all the time and the word is joy. Count it all joy, consider it joy. Francis Chan uh, has a study on right now media. Some of you are on that. Maybe you've gone through that study. Uh, but in his study in James, he, he sums it up this way. He says, what God wants to do is not just make you happy. He wants to make you holy. Sometimes our, our goal for our lives is we want to live a happy life. But I believe that God's perspective, and he's got it right, is not that we just be happy. It's not that he's against that. But his real goal and his real aim is for us to be holy, more like him. He wants you to be a reflection of him. And it's the trials and suffering that make us more like Christ. So that's how when uh, James says it like this, if you're reading in, in, the, in the passage of Scripture, we're going to start with verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. That's how he starts his letter, and he gets right into it. In verse 2, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I want to skip ahead to verse 12 where it says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And that's the goal it should be for each one of us. To persevere through the trials and at some point receive a crown of life where the Lord is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And he's not saying, well done, you have gone the easiest route possible. He's saying, look, you've faced life, you've looked to me, you've trusted in me, and you've allowed me to work in you, and I've been able to shape you and make you and mold you into who you want to be, and now here is your reward. That's what I want for my life. And so we gotta take this perspective, our part in, in, in taking this adversity that is gonna come our way that God allows or he sends into us which, what, for it to do what he intends for it to do, we have to have a perspective, and, and James gives us that. He says you need to, to consider, you need to know, and you need to let. Okay? You need to consider it pure joy. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Because when you face those trials, it's gonna make you stronger, okay? So to have a joyful attitude, consider it pure joy. I don't usually uh, associate joy with trouble. I don't know about you. But James says you should consider it pure joy. It's a matter of faith, a matter of taking what we don't understand, which is our pain, which is our trials, which is the current circumstances we may find ourselves in, and looking at that through a spiritual lens. And so I, I often find myself, uh, as, as I'm maybe counseling with people or just talking through uh, situations in life, say, using this term, you need to step back 
and get a big picture view. And I think that's what he's telling us here. You're in the midst of turmoil. It's time to step back and get a big picture view of what's going on here. Okay? So here's what we do. We, get, we step back and we take a big picture view and what we find is that God has an incredible love for us. His desire is to transform us and make us more like Christ. Not to leave us, but to work in our lives to do what he wants to do and to bring us to that place of maturity and completeness so that we don't lack or miss anything. He said, I want you to get everything that you need that I have for you and this is how, this is how it works. So if we're going to consider it joy, what he's talking about is taking, taking an inventory. Step back, look at the big picture, and evaluate. Here's what I know. Our values will determine our evaluation. What do we value? What do you value in life? Do you value comfort? How many of you like comfort? But if you had to choose comfort or character, what's the right choice? Do you value comfort over character? Do you value the material and the physical over the spiritual? Do you live only for the present and forget the future? You see, our values determine our evaluation. So because of those values, we look at our circumstances and say, you know what, I don't like this too well. I don't like how this makes me feel but I know that there's good gonna come out of this. I know that God's always there. I know that he's working it for my good and I can face whatever it is and he's gonna make me stronger. He's gonna make me better. He's gonna use people around me. It's gonna, it's gonna work all for his purpose and for my good and only in that way can we consider it pure joy. So our values determine our evaluation. Our outlook will determine the outcome. Our attitude determines the action. So if you're going to consider it pure joy, if you won't uh, be able to consider those trials joy, they're going to upset you. They're going to make you bitter, not better. And so God, through the trials, develops perseverance and patience, character and maturity, which is what we all want and need. There's a time when it's just time to grow up. You ever, you ever like said, looked at your kids parents and just said, you know what, you need to grow up. No? I'm the only bad parent that has said something <laughs> stupid like that. Our kids are kids. But there's, there, we want there to be growth in a process of maturing. And, and just because you are a certain age doesn't mean uh, you've matured. There's a difference between being a certain age and, and growing up. Okay, how many of you, you, you still need to grow up some? Okay, and you, you admit that. There's, there's growing up that needs to be done. Okay, just because you're getting older doesn't mean you're maturing. There's a process, and it has to do with how we handle the, the situations of life. So God is developing these things in our life through trials. And guess what? They don't come, they don't come through reading books. They don't even come through reading the Bible necessarily. And it doesn't come through prayer, which are all good things. And I got some news for you. It's not going to come through hearing a good sermon. The things that God wants to teach us, perseverance and, uh, and, and all these things, it's going to come through trials. It's the only way it's going to happen. When we go through those trials, we need to learn to trust God. Trust him no matter what. We need to obey him. And when we do that, then we're going to grow and mature. It's how we can face those trials with a positive attitude and consider it joy. We face these trials, we've got to evaluate them in light of what is God doing in me? What does God want for me? What does God want from me? See, too many people, um, they don't consider it pure joy, but what they do is they complain. I'm guilty. In the midst of something, I'm complaining about my situation. I, I'm, I'm arguing with people. I'm fussing about life. I'm focusing on the pain when I should be focusing on Christ. So what is the purpose behind the pain? Paul gives us a little insight in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. He says, therefore, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles. Now, see, Paul went through a lot of things that were pretty difficult. I don't know how many of you ever stood in front of a, a group of people and been stoned with rocks before. Okay, Paul's, Paul's been there. 
He's been thrown in prison many times. He's been uh, um, run out of town. And he, and he says, our light and momentary troubles. That's big picture stuff. That's him stepping back and saying, you know what? In the light of eternity, in the light of life, all this is small stuff. Light and momentary. He says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We're getting ourselves too focused on things that are temporary and insignificant. And they become bigger than they really are. And I'm not making light of the trouble maybe that you're facing today. But big picture says it's worth it. And it will be worth it all because we can see his footprints right along our path and know that he's working things together in our life for good. Jesus is a perfect example for us to consider joy in the midst of pain. In Hebrews, the author writes, Hebrews 12 too, let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for what? The joy. See, this word joy is always connected to trials and tribulations and pain. Uh, and that should give us a perspective. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's obviously a lot about the cross that Jesus wasn't liking or looking forward to. And, and we know that because he prayed a prayer in the garden that went something like this, Father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering pass from me. He's saying, look, I, I'm not looking forward to this. I don't really want to do this. And if there's any other way, but yet he comes to this conclusion, yet not my will be done, but yours be done. I don't want my way. I want your way. The song that Julie sang was so appropriate. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. So we have a joyful attitude. We consider it pure joy. The second thing that he gives us here is that we need, to, we need to know. We know that the testing of our faith develops perseverance. It's an understanding mind. All of us at some point have wondered, why me? How many of you have ever said that in the midst of something that's going on in your life? You might not have said it out loud, but you definitely said it in your mind and in your heart. Why me? What have I done to deserve this? See, because we're looking at everything out here and, and we're, we're looking at what it looks like on the surface and we're saying, look, you know what? I've tried to follow Christ and all that's happened is this, 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 and this and it seems like I never really ever am getting a victory. But I look at people who aren't even trying to serve God and it seems like they're being totally blessed. You ever had that perspective? Here's what I can tell you. The enemy of your soul is a liar and a thief. And he's out to steal, kill, and destroy. And he will plant any kind of thought, doubt uh, in your mind to keep you from becoming who God wants you and intends you to be. We need to have an understanding mind. And there's some things that we just know. There's some things that we just don't know. And we'll spend a lot of time and a lot of energy literally driving ourselves crazy trying to find out why. Why this? Why that? And what we really need to do is just trust the Lord. Do we trust him and do we believe that he knows best? See, Scripture tells us that his, his ways are not our ways, neither are his thoughts our, our thoughts. He says, as, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. There's no way that we are going to fully understand what God is doing in each and every situation. There's no way that we can fully understand what God is doing in our life, but we know that we can trust him because he's got only our good in, in mind. He's promised that he would work things together for good. He's promised that he's not gonna leave us. All these things that we have as promises help us to know that the tests and the trials that we go through are gonna produce something good in our lives. In other words, when you trust God enough to know that he knows what he's doing, you don't have to go through those situations complaining, being irritable, and feeling defeated. I know that God sees things that I can't see. God knows things that I'll never know. And so I have to look to him. 
It's a good thing to, to, to lean on him and be dependent on him. You don't have to understand everything. And the reality is you're not gonna understand everything. You may not understand much, but keep your eyes on him. Continue to follow him because he knows what he's doing. We don't know everything, but we have a God who does know everything. So we look to him and trust him. Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 12, he said, don't be surprised at the painful trial that you're suffering as though something strange were happening to you. What is this that's going on in my life? But notice in verse 13, he says, but rejoice. It's the word joy that keeps coming up in the midst of pain and trials. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. And so the third thing that that he gives us is this. We need to let that perseverance that has begun in us, let let it allow it to continue to work. James tells us that it's important for us to understand that God has a purpose for our suffering. It's not just random bad things that are going on. There is a purpose, and God will if it's not his purpose. Sometimes the enemy may bring something against us, but God's promise is that he'll use it for our good. So no matter what the suffering, the trial, the test, the difficulty, we need to allow that purpose to take its course. Let that perseverance finish its course, James says, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You can't really know the depth of your character until you see how you react under pressure. Nobody likes taking tests. I don't know, let's take a poll. Anybody like tests? You really got stoked up to, you know, go to class and take a test. We don't really like those kind of things, most of us anyway. You know, it's like, I, if, if, we could just, if we could just pass the test and just say, look, I, I already know everything, I feel like I know it all, uh, we, we, we don't even need to take the test, we'll just go on. Okay, the test is important. It's important because it's going to give you the evaluation. What have you learned? What do you know? And it's good for us because we know, hey, have any of you ever been surprised on a test? My wife, Jeannie, always got stressed out in college at tests. And she would walk out from a test, and I I could guarantee you, 95% of the time, she would say, I failed that test. Anybody else like that here? Just not confident on the test. You take a test, she'd come to find out, she'd probably ace a test, get 100% on it. Just how you feel. But sometimes, here's what I'm trying to get at, is the feelings that we feel sometimes aren't accurate to what's really going on in our life. But sometimes those tests come and it helps us to see, hey, I stood up. I stood up to that and I've made it through. Every one of you have made it through so many things in life. It should give you a perspective looking forward that, hey, what I've made it through, I'm gonna continue to make it through. God has been faithful. He will continue to be faithful. But those tests come and it helps us to see how how we're doing. So instead of complaining about our struggles, we need to see them as opportunities to grow. Here's a prayer that we can pray. Lord, there's real pain in life. And I know looking out here, some of you have experienced some pain and grief in situations that I don't even begin to understand. God knows the pain that we're facing. He knows exactly what we go through. So telling him about your pain is a good thing. Lord, I'm experiencing a lot of pain. And while I don't know why you've allowed this to happen to me, I'm gonna give you thanks. Because I know that you're a good God who has good things in mind for me. That you've promised me that you will always be with me. You're always going to take the circumstances of my life and work them for good. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that God causes everything to work together for good, for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so we give God thanks. Through it all, he's been with us. And he's going to use what we face in life to transform us and make us more like him. I've had my own share of 
troubles that we've gone through. And if I step back and take a, a big picture view, it's like I, I am so much stronger and I think better for the things that I've been through. And while I wish that some things have turned out different, I hadn't, didn't have to go through some of the things that I've gone through in life, I feel like I've got a perspective that is helping me for the future. God is giving us pieces, elements through our life that you don't even realize you've picked up a tool or you've gained an experience in life that may not come into play for years to come. But because of what you went through back then, it'll open a door of opportunity for your future. We have no idea, nor will we ever fully understand until we stand in heaven someday, and it may make sense. And at that point, I don't think we'll really care because we will have, etern- we will have gained an eternal glory that far outweighs everything that we ever have gone through in this life. Story of Joseph in the book of Genesis is one that has always encouraged me. You can read about Joseph the last probably 15 or 16 chapters of Genesis. And Joseph's life was one of just heartbreak after disappointment. And uh, if there was anybody that could say, why me? There's a couple of guys that I think of like Job and Joseph that could say, why me? And really honestly say, why me? Didn't seem like they did anything to deserve what happened to them, but Joseph was one of those guys that situation after situation, things would happen that were just absolutely unbelievable. Like his brothers, they plotted to kill him, and they end up selling him into slavery. And, you know, through everything he made decisions that were godly decisions, but it would always turn out bad. Why? He ended up being thrown into prison for something that he didn't do. He was in prison for years, just waiting for that break to get out. God gave him a vision while he was in prison. And through the course of events of that that vision that he gave him, Joseph ended up being elevated to vice president of Egypt. And part of that vision was that there was a famine that was coming in the land. And the plan was to store up some grain because there was seven years of famine that were coming. And so the Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of that, and lo and behold, famine hits, and people from Israel come, and one day Joseph is standing face to face with his brothers that sold him into slavery. And to make that long story pretty short, some time went on, Uh, Joseph provided for them, and everything seemed to be good, they all moved to Egypt, but then dad dies. And all the brothers are thinking, we're toast now. Joseph has, has held it together, but he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna have it in for us. And so they were scared. And at the, end of the, at the end of the book of Genesis, chapter 50, verse 20, Joseph makes a statement that I think is a, a great big picture perspective. Because after all that had happened to him and all that he had endured for like 17 years of his life, everything seeming to go wrong. And his brothers were fearful, and they said, we'll be your servants forever. We'll be your slaves. And he looks, looks them in the face, and he says, you intended to harm me. This is Genesis 50, 20. But God intended it for good, to accomplish what is being done now, the saving of many lives. And what he's saying is, you didn't put me here. Yeah, your actions put me here, but God looked ahead in time, and this was God's doing. How do we not know that the difficulties that we're facing in life isn't setting up for some event or moment in our life that God has some great plan for that situation and it matters what we do. It matters the perspective. My challenge to you this morning is trust God. Trust God through all of your circumstances one of, the, one of the lines in the song that Julie sang is, he is God and I'm not. And you know what? That's a good perspective to come to grips with. I don't know what's best. I don't see everything. But he does see everything. He does know what's best. And he has the ability to make it happen. We have really no choice this morning but to trust God.
And he is a faithful God that can be trusted. I've lived nearly 50 years of my life and he's not let me down. There's testimonies across the room of even greater things. You've got even greater testimony than that. Yet there's still some of you sitting in the room who are saying, I wish that was my story. I don't know what to do with what I'm facing. This morning, I encourage you to trust God. Because his promise is that he'll take all of those circumstances to shape you, to make you, to grow you, to mature you, and do something amazing in your life if you will let him. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Last night I was just kind of, I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook, but it was one of the first things that came up in my Facebook feed. Uh, it was a message that Helen Ridgway posted yesterday. Coming up, uh, I believe next month, it'll be three years since uh, she lost her husband, Fred. And I saw this and I printed it off and Helen was in the early service and I asked her if it was okay for me to share her post because it seems to fit so perfectly uh, with this message. And this is what Helen said last night about six o'clock on Facebook. It's been nearly three years since Fred has passed away. I chose from those first moments to say, I trust you, Lord. That trust in the Lord who can be trusted is how I have walked through my grief. It's how I have shepherded the wounded and scared hearts of my children and grandchildren. And it's how I have navigated a changed life. When you can't seem to get out from under a cloud, choose wise friends to help you refocus. My life changed radically the day Fred died. But God, period. He helped me figure out things or sent the right people to help me. When change is hard and seems impossibly so, remember who God is and who God created you to be. And I would add who God is shaping you to be. It's all a perspective. How do we see and how do we view 